Hello everyone, welcome to the KZGN News. Today we're bringing news about a home with bombs in it in Johannesburg, an update on the new Super Walmart, news about minorities in the presidential campaigns, new interesting polls about it, today's gas prices, weather, sports, and much more. From the Rademacher Hills to Bee Mountain and the mighty Sierras, Ridgecrest to Inukern and China Lake, this is your news for the Indian Wells Valley with the KZGN News Crew. Hello, I'm Tom Whitney. Thanks for joining us for the news affecting Ridgecrest and the Indian Wells Valley. In a major story from the Kern County Sheriff's Department, we get news about a home with bombs in Johannesburg. Last Thursday, January 7th, the Kern County Sheriff's Office received information from the public that 51-year-old Todd Sloan of Johannesburg, California, made threats against local and federal law enforcement via Facebook. Deputies initiated an investigation and developed probable cause to obtain a search warrant for Sloan's person as well as his residence. The residence is located in the 300 block of Boluwago Avenue in Johannesburg. On Saturday, January 9th, deputies located Sloan at a Johannesburg gas station. He was detained without incident. Upon a search of him, they located a firearm in his possession. Deputies executed the search warrant at Sloan's residence and located numerous improvised and commercial explosives in addition to booby traps throughout his home. The Kern County Sheriff's Office bomb squad is currently in the process of rendering the residence safe with the assistance of the Bakersfield Police Department bomb squad, the Federal Bureau of Investigations, and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. Sloan was arrested for recklessly possessing explosives, possessing explosives, possessing explosive material, and possessing a firearm as a prohibited person. This investigation is ongoing, and the bomb squads are expected to be actively rendering Sloan's residence safe for several days. If anyone has pertinent information regarding this case, please call the Sheriff's Office at 661-861-3110 or call Lt. James Morrison at 661-201-7195. Now here's an update about the new Super Walmart. Here's my interview with Walmart Media Relations Manager, Delia Garcia. Hello everybody, this is Tom Wickner with KGN TV. I've got on the phone Dahlia from Walmart in the Media Relations Department, and we're going to get an update on the new Super Walmart going on here in Ridgecrest. Hello Dahlia, how you doing? Doing great, how are you today? Okay, great. Thanks for taking some time to interview with us, and uh, let's get an update on how the Walmart project is going. Uh, sure, fantastic. Okay, I'd like to know how, how is construction going along now? Well, as you know, that the project is under construction, and overall, uh, today construction is going as planned. Uh, we look forward to welcoming customers to the new Ridgecrest Walmart in the second half of this year, uh, so the second half of uh, 2016. And of course, uh, the community has been eagerly anticipating this store for for many years, and so we're very excited uh, to to be getting closer to opening the store and serving our customers better in Ridgecrest. Mm -hmm. Are you generally on schedule now for the opening that you planned all along? Um, yes. Yeah, so, uh, of course, you know, with any multi-million dollar capital investment, there are many moving parts. Uh, but, but so far, we've been able to stay pretty much on schedule, and there haven't been any notable issues with construction of this new store. Okay, that's that's a good comment there, because I was wondering if the construction crew has run into any kind of construction problems out there, things they didn't know about or anything like that. No, really, again, with uh, any multi-million dollar capital investment, uh, you, you're, you, know, you have a schedule, you, you uh, uh, try to anticipate as much as possible, and really, to date, there haven't been any notable issues that would affect the construction of this new store. Okay, very good. Well, what is the target date for the opening of it? We haven't finalized a specific date yet. We are targeting the uh, second half of this year. So as we continue with construction, we'll be able to give better timelines as to when the actual grand opening date will be scheduled. Okay, very good. Uh, we know that as part of the project of, that wall, of the Super Walmart there, you've had to do a lot of off-site construction as well, uh, roads and entrances and moving utilities and things like that. I was just wondering, uh, how's that been coming along? Well, again, there are lots of moving parts and a lot of organizations and, and entities that are involved in uh, a capital investment project of this size. But uh, everything seems to be on schedule at this point, and um, we do. You know, there are storm drainage improvements and street widening and intersection improvements that are being done. 
and uh, all of that uh, seems to be on schedule at this point. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, because it's it, it closing down a whole road for a while. It's uh, affected everybody here in town, and everybody's wondering, when is it going to open again? <laughs> sure, and then, of course, we, we appreciate uh, everyone's patience. We do know that the community has been eagerly anticipating this store for several years, and we're, we're moving as quickly as we can to be able to finally get it open. The, the existing store in Ridgecrest, you might uh, be interested to know, has been open 25 years. It'll be celebrating 25 years. And, uh, and so really we're excited about this new store, about being able to serve our customers better, offer them a broader assortment of products, including a full line of fresh groceries. And so it's a, a really exciting time for us, and we look forward to keeping you updated uh, on the progress of the store. Okay, very good. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, a lot of people here looking forward to it, too. Uh, I was just wondering, how's things uh, working with the city? Have, have they been very supportive in how they're uh, going along in the project? You know, we really appreciate the city's support in, in helping bring greater access uh, to fresh, affordable groceries to our rich, crust residents and, and customers, um, as well as jobs and capital investment to the community. Okay, very good. Uh, anyway, I appreciate you joining us today. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we go our ways? Thanks so much for giving us an opportunity to provide an update on the progress of this store. Uh, we're really excited to, to keep moving forward and, and to provide updates on how the uh, construction is going. Uh, as we move along the construction time frame, we'll be able to provide better dates and, and uh, time frames for when the store will open. Of course, we'll also keep you updated on that and we'll begin hiring, um, so additional positions for to serve that store and, uh, and opportunities to join the Walmart family. So uh, thanks again for the opportunity, and we look forward to uh, celebrating this new store in the Ridgecrest community. Okay, thanks, Natalia. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. So we got a happy new year. That's great. Thank you. Happy new year. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good day. And thanks go to Walmart Media Relations Manager, Delia Garcia, for the interview. In news about the presidential campaigns, PreserveFreedom.org is reporting that Trump is gaining the most support of minorities within the GOP race. They are reporting that while the liberal media, Hillary and Bernie, label him a racist and a bigot, and countries want to ban him for his comments, the surprise is Trump is the GOP candidate with the strongest minority support. If you went by the headlines, you'd probably get the impression that Trump won't garner any other minority vote. Hillary Clinton has branded him as a racist, as has Bernie Sanders for his comments on Mexican illegal immigrants. But ironically, it seems everyone who's found Trump's comments to be racist is white. Could it be that people that criticize Trump are basing their statements on political correctness? instead of reality? As World Net Daily reported regarding Trump's polling numbers, pundits might point to billionaire Donald Trump's huge lead in the GOP presidential race as being the result of his generally anti-Washington, anti-government, anti-establishment, anti-politically correct attitude. If so, it's not just whites who are ticked at the bureaucracy, but minorities too. For the GOP to win the White House, strong minority votes are needed. Maybe Trump's appeal and message is beyond race. Perhaps what Trump is saying, and what people believe, is the same. In other polls for the presidential race, Newsmax is reporting a very interesting poll of likely party switch voters. When asked if they would consider switching to the other party in the next election, nearly 20% of Democrats would leave the party and vote for Republican Donald Trump in a matchup against Hillary Clinton. According to the new poll, the survey of 916 likely voters by the Mercury Analytics research firm in Washington found that only 14% of Republicans would cross party lines and vote for Clinton. The challenge to Hillary, if Trump is the nominee and pivots to the center in the general election as a problem-solving, independent-minded, successful, get-it-done businessman, is that Democrats will no longer be able to count on his personality and outrageous soundbites to disqualify him in the voters' minds, said Ron Howard, Mercury Analytics CEO. The survey was conducted between Wednesday and Friday last week and has a margin of error of 3.5%. Here are the key results among those crossover voters. When these voters were asked, are you 100% sure you'll vote for the candidate of the other party? Democrats responded, 63% say they are 100% sure they would vote for Trump over Clinton. In the Republican response, 39% said they are 100% sure they would vote for Clinton over Trump. So as Trump's message is resonating more and more with people on both parties, the Clinton and Sanders campaigns have got to be scrambling on how to overcome challenges by each other 
and appeal more to the general population. The importance of this poll is that these are likely voters. There are lots of polls done every day, but the polls that stick to likely voters have more importance. These are the opinions of people that are likely to vote versus the ones that just stay home on election day. All right, stay with us for news from the City Meeting Air Committee when we come back. Thanks for staying with us. In news from the city, the meeting our committee is scheduled to meet Tuesday afternoon at 4.30 in City Hall, Conference Room B. The current committee members are Warren Cox as Chairman, Solomon Roger Martin, Vice Chairman, with other members Leslie O'Neill, Dan Spurgeon, Tex Hopus, Peggy Schoff, Debbie Benson, and Mayor Peggy Breeden. On this agenda, they'll cover the following items. First, they'll get an update of the Caltrans permit approval process for the China Lake Boulevard meeting our projects. Stephen Weisenreed, Caltrans permit engineer, will report on the status of the final approvals for median art sites number 5, 11, 15, and 16. Next, they'll get a presentation from Gary Charlon from Ridge Project in reference to recommended improvements to city rights of way. Then they'll get an update and status report of the China Lake Boulevard Medium Art Suite sponsors and artists regarding reserved median art sites number 1, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, and 13, 17, and 18. Next there will be a discussion of ways and means to promote the adoption of the yet unsponsored median art sites 2, 3, 4, 6, and 14. And finally, there will be a preliminary discussion regarding median art themes on other city rights of way. Now that a successful project has been established for North Tyler Boulevard, it is appropriate for the Median Art Committee to consider planning for median art upon other medians. So if you're interested in the median art project, attend Tuesday afternoon at 4.30 p.m. at City Hall. Now here's a report about the upcoming Republican Women's Meeting from KZG and Field reporter Tanya Pyle. Tanya reports that the Ridgecrest Republican Women Federated will have their next luncheon this Friday, January 15th, from noon to 1.30 p.m. in the banquet room at the Clarion Inn. It's located at 901 North China Lake Boulevard. Chip Holloway, Executive Director of the Desert Empire Fairgrounds, will be their guest speaker. Holloway was born in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and grew up in New Orleans. He attended Louisiana State University. For about 25 years, Holloway was in the restaurant business, buying and selling restaurants throughout the United States, such as Texas Cattle Company. He chose to settle in Ridgecrest in 1992 when he purchased the former original hamburger stand on China Lake Boulevard. Eventually, it was converted to Dernerweiner Schnitzel, and Tasty Freezer was added. In 2010, Chip launched Endeavors Unlimited Consulting. The company offers political advocacy, marketing, and management services. His biggest current clients include the Desert Empire Fairgrounds, where he serves as the executive director, and Waste Management, where he is their commercial recycling consultant. In 1998, Chip was recruited by many to run for Ridgecrest City Council, and the rest is history, as they say. He served 16 years in public office, including two terms as mayor. Holloway has never been married, and he has no children. He is engaged to Deanna Lukens. The cost of the luncheon is $15, and reservations are required. There is still time to make a reservation. To make your reservation, call 760-446-0815. Again, They'll meet Friday at noon. Now in case the Jan's continuous effort to provide news and information you've asked for, here are today's gas prices for Ridgecrest and some surrounding areas. Well, since my last report last Friday, gas prices everywhere have held steady. But there is one station that has dropped two cents per gallon. And Ridgecrest has the lowest prices in all the areas we are monitoring. As of this morning, Ridgecrest is ranging from 275 to 319. Lancaster is from 285 to 319. The LA Valley area 289 to 309, and the Bishop area 286 to 309. We have one station at that 275 amount, and four stations at 277 per gallon. Tune in Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays for updates. We at KZGN always suggest you shop locally to support our local economy. Remember, when you pay sales tax out of town, you are helping those cities pave their streets instead of here. Now stay tuned for weather and sports when we come back.
Thanks for staying with us. Now here's Lane with the weather. Thank you, Tom. From the National Weather Service, moderate to major river flooding will continue to impact locations across the central and southern U.S. this week as the Mississippi River flood wave slowly moves downstream. Meanwhile, the Ohio and Illinois rivers will remain in moderate flood stage along the southern tip of Illinois, but floodwaters are receding. Temperatures across the nation. Carolina's at 46, Georgia at 42, Arkansas at 42, northern Texas at 43, Arizona at 55, and Los Angeles at 61. And for us locally, tonight, partly cloudy with a low around 28, southwest wind 5 to 10 miles per hour. Tuesday, sunny with a high near 56 with a calm wind. Tuesday night, partly cloudy with a low around 28, southeast wind 5 miles per hour. Wednesday, a 40% chance of rain, partly sunny with a high near 55, west-northwest wind 5 miles per hour. Wednesday night, a 20% chance of showers, mostly cloudy with a low around 37, southwest wind 5 miles per hour. And Thursday, mostly sunny with a high near 55, west wind 10 miles per hour. And that is your forecast for the IWV. Now back to Tom. Thanks, Lane. And now here's Tom Heck with sports. And a very pleasant Monday late afternoon to everyone. Let's talk about Burroughs High School basketball. Let's start with the girls. They won big at home on Friday night. They beat Asperia very easily, 56-19 to to be exact. The JV team also won their game by 21 points. Now the Burroughs girls have a big game on Wednesday night. They play Oak Hills here in Ridgecrest. I'll also broadcast that game on 1240 a.m. starting at 6.00. 30. The JV girls play at 4.30. That's this coming Wednesday. Now, Oak Hills and Burroughs are the top two teams in the league. And in all honesty, these two teams are probably playing for first place on Wednesday. Other teams not all that good in the league. Burroughs right now has a record of 11-3 overall, 1-0 and in the league. The boys didn't fare as well. They dropped a game over to Speria. Hesperia has a very good squad. They defeated the Burroughs by 21 points. The Burroughs now have a record overall of 2-11, 0-1 in the league. The JV boys team also dropped their game to Asperia. Doug Hayes and crew will play on the road Wednesday. They'll take on Oak Hills High School over in Asperia. The boys will be home on Friday. They'll play Saltana. We'll have that one on radio also starting at 6.30 on 1240 a.m. A lot of basketball going on. Toronto Tornadoes off to a very good start. They beat Lucerne Valley on Friday night. They're now seven wins and one loss. They are leading the high-low league right now. They have a very good squad. Trona High School will play Tuesday night. They will play at home against Baker High School. The girls playing before the boys, 5 and 6.30 are those starting times over there. All right, let's take a look at the NFL. It's very seldom when four games Four road teams win four games in the playoffs. I'm not sure it's ever been done. I'll have to try to Google that and find out. I did try to look it up a little bit, and I didn't really find anything for first-round playoff games. Pittsburgh beat Cincinnati 18-16. That was Saturday night. Cincinnati had that game won. They had the ball with a minute 40 to go. They fumbled. Pittsburgh got it back, drove downfield, had a big fourth down. Ben Rothenberger, who got hurt, came back in the game, got him a first down, and then the big blow of the night, two crucial penalties, unneeded penalties against the Bengals, cost them the football game. You'd have to see it to believe it if you saw it. It was a crying shame. Boomer Esiason, after the game, on the post-game show for CBS, said, you know what? I was a Cincinnati Bengal, and I'll tell you what, that was the most embarrassing thing I have ever seen. Totally embarrassing, he said, and it was a needless penalty, then another needless penalty, a personal foul, unsportsmanlike conduct, and then an illegal hit to the head, and that was the difference. Pittsburgh kicked a field goal with just a few seconds left. Kansas City shuts out the Texans 30 to nothing. That wasn't even close. The Chiefs started out 1-5 on the year, and then won the next 10 games in a row, so right now Kansas City will move on. Seattle beats Minnesota 10 to 9. Blair Walsh missed a 27-yard field goal with two seconds to go. If you can imagine, what a way to lose. Final score 10 to 9. Seattle moves on. Green Bay comes out of nowhere from the dead. They beat Washington 35 to 17. 
All right. So the playoffs will be set up. We'll talk more about those later. The Clippers won last night. They beat the Pelicans 104-101. They have won nine in a row now. They're 27 and 15. Chris Paul hit a three at the end to win the game for them. And also the Lakers lost last night. They lost at home. They didn't have Kobe Bryant or DeAndre Russell, and they lose to Utah by 10 points. All right, in the NBA, Lionel Hollins has been fired by the Brooklyn Nets. He was off to a 10-27 and record. And the 76ers and LeBron James didn't well match well together. The Cavaliers crushed the 76ers. The poor Philadelphia 76ers, three wins, 32 losses. Oh, not very good at all. LeBron James, 37 points yesterday. Dallas, Cleveland, the Grizzlies, Houston, Denver all get wins, including the New York Knicks. I think the Knicks' most improved team in the NBA. All right, UCLA basketball. They beat Arizona dramatically with a step back three at the very end of the game on Thursday night. Then they beat ASU 71-64, not to be outdone by USC. USC beats Arizona State. Then they beat Arizona in four overtimes on Saturday over at USC. Four overtimes, the third longest game in college basketball history. And that's your sports for this Monday. I'm Tom Heck for KCGN. So that's some news for today. All the KZGN TV know you have a choice in what you watch for your news. We all thank you for choosing KZGN TV, Ridgecrest's only locally owned community TV station. Now stay tuned for Ridgecrest Talk coming up next. But first, check out this video of a train plowing through the heavy snow. <laughs> 